morning everybody i know we're all starting to get into the cop mode some of us have just arrived some of us have um, still arriving i think but i'm really glad to have all of you here and i'm really glad for the panelists to join us this morning we've got a very very interesting couple of hours ahead of us uh, and i say that purposely we've got three parts to this session the first one is really going to talk about the role of development financial institutions and international organizations in accelerating, aligning, and scaling up financing for resilience of infrastructure. The second part, we're going to make a very, very, very exciting announcement. And we'll have some supporters to support that announcement. That will happen at 11. And then the third part, we're going to have some reflections from additional partners who will be building off of that announcement. So what that announcement is, is it, it's a secret for now. It's you know building up your appetite for it. Um, I'm Amit Prothi. I'm the Director General for CDRI, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Um, we are a coalition of 31 member countries. We were launched in 2019 by the Prime Minister of India to take a leadership role in disaster resilient infrastructure. Amongst our partners include the US government, UK government, Australia, Chile, Brazil, Dominican Republic, Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. So 31 member countries from a diverse range of geographies, uh, development pathways, um, risks, et cetera. We also have members such as the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, EIB, which is the last member that joined us, CCRI. So we've got now 39 member countries. Our priorities are disaster resilient infrastructure. And the way we address that, you know, our, we don't focus on supporting implementation as much as we support capacity development, knowledge creation, and technical assistance. So that's really our mandate as an organization. Um, today's session, you know, we are, we are here to really talk about the risks that we are seeing in infrastructure, both in existing infrastructure, but also exist infrastructure that we are building for the future. We, ha you know, just this morning, I woke up to the news of an earthquake in Kathmandu, right? And I happened to be in Kathmandu in 2015 when the earth last earthquake happened, the major Gorkha earthquake happened. And I, Walking around the city, you see devastation. So you see you know, buildings collapse. So you see loss of infrastructure. But you also see buildings standing, where essentially building codes in that case had also prevented a lot more devastation that could have happened. So when we look at infrastructure, CDRI is trying to see how do we actually make sure that we address the current risks in infrastructure and how do we make sure that the future risks are not locked into the infrastructure that we're developing? So with that statement, I really am very happy to see three partners here who are promoting infrastructure across the world. And I'd really like to get your reflections and how are you and each of your institutions looking at risk, looking at climate change in your portfolios of work going ahead? Yeah. So with that, I'd like to first invite Mr. Juan Pablo Bonilo, Manager for Climate Change and Sustainable Development in the Inter-American Inter Development Bank. Bonilo, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, congratulations for all the work that you are doing, particularly to share knowledge among all of us related to, to this topic. The IDB group, we have uh, the public side, which is the Inter-American Development Bank, and the private side, which is uh, IDB Invest. And uh, both, as a group, we have a climate finance target of uh, 30% that we will increase to 35% in the next uh, three, four years. But at the same time, we develop a new methodology about green financing that includes nature, biodiversity, local pollution, circular economy. And with that, we want to go above 40% as, as a group. Having said that, in the past, we developed you that we addressed it, that we addressed at the beginning, what we addressed at the beginning was infrastructure. At the beginning was infrastructure. It was infrastructure. We started infrastructure. We started with energy. We started with energy. We started with energy, with transport, with water. 
Then we started working with rural development with cities that are also part of my department, the sustainability department. And in the last year, we have engaged more with the social department of the bank to start learning about cash transfers, everything that they did for the social area. And why I mentioned in social? Because I, we're starting to, to see a very important relationship about managing risks and disasters with the social department how we can use safety nets that were created to issues like health or, edu or education to be also the safety nets for disaster response. So going back to natural disasters and resiliency, the ADB has a very integrated approach. We have, uh, we have an, an uh, indicator that we call the IGOP. It's an indicator for governance of uh, disasters in the region in which we measure the institutional and fiscal capacity of our countries to address natural disasters. But at the same time, to complement that, we have developed the contingency line of credits that are line of credits for the ministers of finance to once they face a disaster, use that credit line immediately. The good thing of that credit line is that they don't have to pay any interest until they use it. And the other good thing is that those lines doesn't compete with the pipeline that we develop every year with the country. So doesn't is not part of the envelope that we have every year with the ministers of finance. So in that way, they have the incentive to have the contingency line without affecting the envelope of the ADB without government and just pay interest when they use it. So, so far, we have been very successful. So thank you. In, uh, did you hear what I was saying before? Yes. Okay, good. So. We, we've seen that most of, uh, of the countries of the Caribbean, Central America, and other countries already have the contingency lines that uh, for us has been a tremendous advance. But now the next step is how to develop resiliency. And that is something that uh, for the future, and going back to your question, is since the design of the projects, since the design from both sides, the public side and the private side, how we can uh, introduce the resiliency component. Internally, we have developed as, as a group an, a methodology to assess climate risk. So we're using that methodology already for all the projects of the ADB, and that's going to be key, by the way, of Paris alignment. For those of you that are familiar with the methodology that we are producing, by the way, we have a meeting today at 1.30, right? All are invited to the MDB pavilion to know more about our methodology. The B2 part that is related to adaptation for us, it's going to be key, the climate risk analysis that we're doing for all the projects of the bank. But the question is thinking as a system, how we can start having the incentives from rating agencies, for example, to when you are investing in resiliency to improve your rating from the public side and the private side. Because if you don't have an asset that you are investing in resiliency at the beginning, the incentives to reduce pricing because they are investing in resiliency, I think we're not gonna be able to scale that up. That is something that goes beyond the LDBs. That is part of the financial system that we need to talk with the uh, rating agencies. That is something that I hope we can uh, de develop and discuss in another event that uh, there is this afternoon at the US Center with the US Treasury to start working with uh, rating agencies in the future. The other thing that is key for resiliency is uh, the work together of the public and private sector. What I've learned from our partners in Bid Invest is that when there is a, a PPP or a concession of infrastructure, when the, when, the, when the sponsor comes to IDB for financing, it's too late to have included resiliency. So that's how we need to work from the public side to agree with the governments in the policy changes, but also in introducing, in the terms of reference of concessions, the key part of resiliency of infrastructure to then have the, the sponsors financing that component. So, just to, to resume, disaster risk analysis as part of our portfolio, key, internally, and that has to become a knowledge instrument of the bank and, and of our banks for the governments. So the, the, the tool that we're using could be a tool used by the governments in the future and from the companies. Second, work together public and private sector to include resiliency since the beginning of the design of PPPs before sponsors come to the financing. And third, work as a financial system to have rating agencies and others and insurance companies recognizing resiliency to reduce risk and premiums uh, for the future. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, you know, you really brought a rich richness to your response here. Talked about credit line that you're offering. Talked about social protection also that works in this context when infrastructure fails. Um, I would pick up a little bit more, but maybe I'll go to the next speaker for a minute. And here, let's hear from um, Ms. Noel O'Brien, Director for Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management at the ADB Asian Development Bank. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just let me test the microphone as the first step. Um, so thank you to CDRI for inviting ADB to this session and for all the collaboration over the last couple of years. Uh, so strengthening resilience of infrastructure is a key priority of the Asian Development Bank to advance its climate actions and commitments. Uh, at the highest level, our commitments include aligning our operations with the goals of the Paris Agreement, um, uh, by July 2023 for all of our sovereign operations and 85% of our non-sovereign operations also by mid-23 and 100% alignment by 2025. And obviously this uh, includes uh, the climate adaptation and resilience goals as Juan Pablo has already indicated. At the higher scale, we've made a commitment of 100 billion uh, of climate finance between 2013 and 2023, um, and, sorry, an ambition of, of, of 100 billion and 34 billion of climate adaptation finance within that period. So um, complementing the kind of approaches that Juan Pablo has discussed today, I just like to, hi to highlight three key approaches that ADB is increasingly undertaking to scale up our support for resilience. Focused, focused approach, focused approach for focused approach for infrastructure, for infrastructure, for infrastructure resilience, infrastructure resilience, resilience, resilience. So back in 2014, ADB put in place a climate and disaster risk screening and assessment process which ensures that all the infrastructure we are financing is climate proof. Uh, while this is important, uh, with the rapidly increasing climate and disaster risk and the kind of compounding of events that we've seen in 2022, uh, we recognize that it is important that the starting point of financing infrastructure should be a comprehensive understanding of current and future risk faced by a concerned system. And when we talk about the system, it could be a city, it could be an island, it could be a province, it could be a watershed, or it could be a particular sector. And this understanding should guide the identification of the type of infrastructure that's needed to steer development in a resilient direction. And not only the type, but also the location, et cetera. Um, we've done, we have a couple of emerging examples, but one where we've already completed a multi-hazard and disaster risk assessment is on the island of Tonga Tapu in the Pacific. It is the island that is home to uh, Tonga City, Nuku'alofa, and it was also the center of the uh, volcano uh, in J January 2022. So uh, we've done a whole island um, uh, assessment uh, we've looked at a range of potential scenarios for extreme rain, uh, uh, earthquakes, um, but also sea level rise and the kind of surges that are likely to come with storms. And that, now that um, uh, risk assessment, which was done in very close collaboration with the government of Tonga, it's helping uh, in the development of a spatial planning process for the city with the intent that that will support the development of an adaptation pathway. And that will identify the infrastructure needed in different sectors per, for pursuing climate resilient development of the island. It's an interesting context because the island does have land as high as 65 meters. So it, it does have areas and there, are, there is scope for decision making. So the second area of focus is a scale up of financing that is dedicated to adaptation infrastructure investments. So these investments directly re respond to the priorities identified by countries in their national adaptation plans and their national disaster risk reduction plans. 
So for example, in Chennai, in India, we are supporting, supporting a large scale infrastructure project to ensure that urban flooding, uh, to, a, to, to reduce urban flooding uh, through a, co a combination of uh, gray and green measures. And, and further to incentivize the countries under such dedicated uh, adaptation investments we have created a special window under our Asian Development Fund, which provides some concessional financing to the poorer countries in the region, because recognizing this question of concessionality and adaptation investments. The purpose of this special window is to provide additional grant resources for projects that have a primary objective of building climate and disaster resilient. So, for example, resources from the fund is supporting uptake of nature-based solutions in coastal areas um, in Bangladesh, but also in emergency shelters in Vanuatu, also in the Pacific. Um, and the third point that I'll just explore is the use of different financing instruments uh, for strengthening infrastructure resilience. So while traditional investment projects have been the focus of our adaptation investments, sorry. Yeah, my, my finger. Uh, we are exploring opportunities provided by different financing instruments to strengthen uh, infrastructure investments. And one of such example is in the People's Republic of China as part of a water supply and drainage program in Shandong province, we are using sector development project modality, which combined policy-based actions along with project investment. And this has allowed introducing uh, specific policy actions in the project to strengthen the coordination of flood risk management, urban drainage, and sponge city-related measures. And this is an important institutional reform needed for the successful implementation of the resilience investments. Uh, we have similar examples in Indonesia. An energy sector program is using results-based financing to strengthen maintenance and operations of resilience energy infrastructure. So we believe that over time, these three approaches and others will help us in scaling up and financing both quantity and quality for infrastructure resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, it's interesting. I had to happen to work in both Chennai and China and uh, on the Spun City implementation. I think I'm really keen to maybe explore that a little bit more because we're all talking a lot about nature-based solutions. Um, you know, all the institutions are talking about it about as a solution to uh, flooding and other other dividends. So I think let's come back to that for a minute and see how we can collectively, you know, promote the agenda of NBS because it's important, but it's still not yet picked up on the ground. Uh, so with that, I'll also now invite Stephen O'Driscoll, uh, head of the Environment, Climate Change, and Social Policy at a, uh, a European Investment Bank. Thank you, Chair. Is that working? Is that working now? Yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed, and I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, being invited onto the panel today. Thank you. And um, also just like to say that as the new bank in town, really, be really pleased to be an official member now of CDRI. I think we signed up in July of this year, just after you joined. Um, so we're really hoping to be able to bring some of our technical expertise to bear um, in this space, uh, in which we've been working for a long time, and also to, uh, well, hopefully to bring some substantial amounts of financing to the table as well, which is always what you want from an MDB. Um, for those of you that don't know the EIB, we are the um, long-term financing arm of the European Union. Um, but actually, more importantly than that, we've transformed ourselves over the last three or four years into the um, EU Climate and Environment Bank. And uh, we made some very serious uh, commitments to that end in late 2019. And um, in 2020, which seems like a very long time ago now, we produced our Climate Bank Roadmap, as we call it, which was designed to kind of operationalize those commitments. Um, and those commitments were, were very serious. We said that uh, everything that we do by the end of 2020, was it now, would be Paris aligned, and we've achieved that. We have a very significant Paris alignment framework in place, and that's the first filter through which everything passes in order for us to be able to even look at financing it. 
Um, secondly, we said that at least 50% of our financing would be specifically for climate action, environmental sustainability, which includes adaptation, of course, and disaster risk, 50% um, by 2025. And when you think that our annual financing is, is touching 70 billion in, in some years, you know, it's quite a substantial amount. So that's our green finance that we bring to the table, is that we bring to the table, um, to the table, um, 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 as with the... Um, as with the other MD, as with the other MDBs and my, with the other MDBs and my colleagues, MDBs and my colleagues here, our values and my colleagues here, our value added, colleagues here, our value added is really that we, um, um, we exercise convening power, right? So we, we generate discussion at national and government level, um, where um, we're always involved in developing uh, robust pipelines. We have project preparation support facilities. Um, and we like to get involved in the institutional capacity building as well. So, um, and very importantly, uh, along with our colleagues here, um, we're able to actually cr crowd in uh, private finance. Um, our statutes actually only allow us to finance 50% of any particular project cost, so that means that we have to work alongside others, including the private sector, to, to make projects happen. Um, and the other thing that we promised to do in our uh, Climate Bank Roadmap was to flesh out our very first dedicated adaptation plan, um, which we did during the course of last year. Um, we've actually been mainstreaming adaptation for very many years now. Um, what we have in place is a climate risk uh, assessment tool. When, whenever we start a project in the pre-screening phase, we apply our tool. Um, and so that tells us effectively whether a project is, is, has high, medium or low risk. Um, and then um, if we see that it's medium or high, then we engage very seriously with the promoters and it may be that uh, we develop with them climate risk uh, vulnerability assessment. So we've been doing that for many, many years. Um, infrastructure is our core business, of course, so it's very key that uh, the resilience of that infrastructure is, uh, is ensured. We don't want to have assets on the books that uh, are not resilient to future climate change, so it's absolutely fundamental and it's involved in everything we do. So, is it closer? There's a better, sorry. Um, so the, our adaptation plan is really designed around five main areas. Um, and it does actually closely align with the EU adaptation strategy, which is the narrative there is, is smarter, swifter, and uh, more systemic, systemic adaptation. So firstly, we set ourselves a very specific adaptation target, which I'm sure my colleagues will agree in an institution like ours is not necessarily the easiest thing to, to do, but we, we went the extra mile. And uh, what we've said uh, effectively means that we'll triple our adaptation financing by, by 2025. Secondly, we've set up a dedicated adaptation advisory service called ADAPT. Um, that was primarily for inside the EU, um, but we're looking to expand that outside the EU as well. And this is where we can um, uh, support borrowers to, to um, develop a, you know, a pipeline that you know, we can invest in. Um, thirdly, we very much wanted to increase our risk appetite. We felt that was an area that we needed to improve on. So whereas we can only usually finance 50%, we can now, now finance 75% of a project which is primarily motivated by adaptation. And um, in small island um, developing states and least developed countries, we can actually finance 100% of projects. Project costs, that is. Uh, fourthly, and I think this is very important, um, Data is, is seriously lacking, still seriously lacking, um, to, to address resilience issues. So uh, we've actually partnered with the um, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, uh, the EU Copernicus program, that is, to uh, really provide to our promoters when they're actually designing their projects good high-resolution climate data. And this is actually a requirement of the uh, EU taxonomy regulation as well. So we've stepped up there. And then partnerships, of course. Um, partnerships are key, so together with our MDB colleagues and uh, the African Development Bank in particular, where we're working alongside them for the Accelerator Program, the African Adaptation Accelerator Program, and uh, with the Global Centre for Adaptation as well. I've got a number of project examples, but perhaps I'll, I'll stop there and um, come to you. Thank you for that, uh, Steve. Stephen. Um, you know, all three of you mentioned commitments. And I think it's important that we are committing to advance the agenda on climate. I think also when you look around, mitigation gets more of the pie of that commitment and adaptation doesn't get as much. I think we, are, we, are being, we want to be ambitious, but we are not yet able to actually be that ambitious on the adaptation side. 
So I just want to take the example of nature-based solutions because I think that does come up a lot in all of our materials as an agenda that we all want to push forward. And it will be good to hear from each of you a reflection on, you know, how does one take something that maybe traditionally was a way of addressing risks, we had adapt, you know, it was part of some societies. We've moved away from that more towards the gray infrastructure in the last few decades, centuries. And now we're trying to bring back this gray and green. There are different ways of saying it, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I've realized is we are missing on the capacity side because now our engineers have not understood quite frankly how to address these risks through nature-based solutions. Our codes are probably not also saying that if you want to address flooding, well, try to look at some other alternatives. So I'm just curious from all three of you, from your institutional perspective, how are you taking a look at an alternate way of addressing infrastructure, or looking at infrastructure, in this case, nature-based solutions? So who wants to take the first stab at that? We can follow the same order, yes. Uh, um, thank you, it's a, it's a very good question. We, um, at the IDB, we started a couple of years ago, the Natural Capital and Biodiversity Lab. Um, and we took the decision a year and a half ago to merge that into the climate division. Because we thought it was important to send that signal that nature and biodiversity was part of the climate solution. And start putting more nature-based solutions into the mainstreaming of climate. So that has been very important in the mainstreaming inside the bank, project by project. Um, in the last two, three years, we had about 30 projects of infrastructure, including nature-based solutions, for about $900 million. And part of the DNA of the Natural Capital Lab is to also develop a financial innovation for nature-based solutions. So we're, with the lab, we're saying that we need to value first not only intrinsic value of nature, but environmental services of nature, to take that into account in, of the decision making. Um, so we're doing that in different levels. What is in national accountings? For example, we're working with the planning department of Colombia to do that, but also with the Central Bank of Chile to start seeing how central banks start introducing into national accountings the value of nature. That's the first step if you want to then introduce when you're going to have, again, a PPP or a development of an infrastructure project, the value of nature. So with mangroves, that I always put the example of mangroves. I grew up in a coastal city, so um, we see the importance of mangroves, not only for climate, but also for cleaning the water, for resiliency for hurricanes. With the Natural Capital Lab, we have started to value the mangroves in different areas of the region. In the Caribbean, with the West uh, and Indies University, we're developing that methodology. Panama, the port of Panama, port of Panama, and Panama, and different uh, and different actors and different actors, Audubon Society, because also the link of mangroves with birds, to introduce mangroves into the not only policy making of the city, but also of the country as a whole. Um, high. Paramos, which are high altitude ecosystems in Andean countries, we're already working on valuing uh, not only the, the Paramos as a provider of water, but also to start doing payment for ecosystem services for those ecosystems. And as part of that, we have at the ADB a new initiative that we started two and a half years ago for the Amazon. It's a sustainable um, development initiative for all the countries of the Amazon with four pillars. It's a very broad initiative social, sustainable infra, cities, bioeconomy, climate, biodiversity. But a key part of that is going to start saying payment for results based on nature. So we are, we're going to start a pilot uh, with the state of Pará in Brazil that we hope will be a very good example for other states of the Amazon. So uh, at the end, if we talk about nature-based solutions, I like what Noel said about systems. It's not only seeing how we can include nature as part of the design of projects. But beyond that, if, you, if we see it as a system, how we have the methodologies to value nature and the intrinsic value of nature to include that into the economic decision for infrastructure and then for cities, and as you said, Noel, from the territory. To finalize, and before I forget, zoning and planning. 
is going to be key for adaptation, resiliency, and nature day based solutions. If you don't invest upstream in do a good zoning and planning, and you map where are nature based solutions and you value that, I think that's the first step to really make that part of the whole decision making. Sorry, thank you so much. You know, thanks, Juan Pablo. And a, a couple of areas from, from ADB's side. Um, so at the first level, I think it's really essential that we have some uh, grant financing, uh, technical assistance of some form, which allows us to understand the risk, which allows us to invest in, in understanding the future risk and what are the opportunities that exist there. Um, we have various examples where we have investment in mangrove as part of uh, risk reduction in the Pacific and across uh, East Asia, East Southeast Asia. Um, we have one example uh, with the, the development of the Clark City in, in, in um, the Philippines where we have uh, provided uh, technical assistance financing uh, for understanding how the current natural run of the river can be enhanced and with zoning of land in and around the, the river zone to protect um, a future flooding as part of, of a modern city design. Uh, so, and you, you men we mentioned the Shandong uh, context in, in, in the earlier uh, uh, question. And so maybe we also to focus in on one of the areas there in what we call a sponge city. Uh, this is where we are investing in flood resilient uh, urban and rural territory and, and communities. And, and in this context, if we look at the best practices, it is integrating um, ecological flood risk management and river rehabilitation using a combination of green infrastructure and, and nature-based solutions. And so uh, this, also, this involves the integration of farmland irrigation as, as part of the flood management process, uh, also uh, addressing wastewater collection and, uh, uh, and treatment um, by expanding sewer pipe networks uh, and building state-of-the-art uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, so... Um, the, these are um, uh, obviously require investment also in not just the, the understanding of the risk, but also policy investments. So working with national uh, and regional governments, so to be able to do that zoning and put in place the appropriate policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know this was a little bit of a left field question because we hadn't really prepared you for it, but I think part of it is, you know, we are trying to adaptation is requiring us to think in newer ways and different ways and I think I want to push each of you because you're actually part of setting up the evidence you know your national accounting system for example is how does one country start to actually understand what is the value of these systems which uh, provide a lot of additional benefits that may not just be monetized at some level so I think uh, but Stephen over yeah. to you I mean it's a great question it's, it's not an easy one of course because we know that the investment barriers are significant in, uh, you know, uncertain revenue uh, streams, um, bankability, scalability, these are not easy issues. So, and we've recognized this for quite some time, and this is why um, over the last couple of years we've been working with the Commission actually on a support basis with the Natural Capital Finance Facility, where we've had, um, I forget how much it is now, but 120 odd million with the Commission to set up some pilot projects to test some of these issues out, to test de risking mechanisms and so on. Um, and that's gone well. Um, however, we need to learn the lessons and we need to adjust. And that's what we'll be doing um, soon as well. Um, the point that one Pablo made about um, making sure that we actually um, account for nature and nature-based solutions in our economic uh, cost-benefit analysis is key, really key. Um, this is something that um, we have to demonstrate. We have to hit a certain economic rate of return uh, for every project that we finance. And we're in the process now of looking at how we can actually apply um, you know, proper values to uh, nature in that, uh, in that assessment. And actually, the Dasgupta review gave us some interesting uh, thinking uh, material there. So we're working very hard on that. And also, together with the other MDBs, we issued our joint statement on nature uh, last year. Um, and we're working on 
proper definitions, proper uh, tracking methodologies, um, what is a nature positive investment, um, because it's important to get these, uh, these, these definitions understood. And one of the things that we have been doing actually is through our um, climate city uh, gap fund, um, or city climate gap fund, is, is um, supporting various cities. And this is where we uh, provide technical advisory services upstream to help the uh, regions and the cities think about properly integrating nature-based solutions into their climate strategies. And uh, one example of that is some, some great work we've done in Athens with the, uh, with the city of Athens. So we have many, many um, uh, green areas through the, through the city now. Um, so nature-based solutions is very key for, for everything that we do as well. So it's a, it's a great question. And we need to do a lot more, for sure. Thank you for that. I think that brings us on time for this session. Um, I do appreciate your support. I think, you know, we are the new kids on the block, but I th hopefully we have, you know, you already joined us. ADB is already a member. IDB, we need to work with you a little bit more, but really I think look at us as a partner in pushing newer agendas, pushing particularly the disaster resilience space with a focus on adaptation. And you know, let's find ways of how we can engage on the ground because we have a lot of political support from our governments as well. So with that, thank you very much for joining the panel. Hello, everyone. Um, so I think it's time for a little bit of a drum roll. So I don't know who's good at drumming, but <laughs> I'm not really. But And the drum roll really is that we, as CDRI, are really, really, really excited to launch our trust fund. And the Infrastructure Resilient Accelerator Fund, which we nice, nicely like to call IRAF, is something that we are launching today with support of a lot of governments and other partners. So first of all, I want to thank um, on stage here, we have US. Um, See, I'm so excited, I'm losing my words here for a minute. <laughs> um, so IRAF, as we like to call it, will support global action on disaster resident infrastructure, especially in developing countries and small island development states. With an initial duration of five years, this multi-party trust fund has already received commitments amounting to $50 million. <laughs> yes, exactly. And this is from the governments of India. You have Kamal Kishore representing government of India, and you'll hear from him in a minute. We have the UK government support here. Thank you, Ken, for joining us. We have Australian government support here. Thank you, Tilly, should I? Christy, to joining us. And EU, and we have from EU a representative here, representative here as well. But I also want to really, really, really acknowledge two UN partners who have been instrumental in giving us the support that we needed as CDRI to just get started, because we're very new, to start building our capacity, to be able to have this ambition and the ability to announce today that we're launching a trust fund. But she's been a but she's been a fantastic, been a fantastic, 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 fantastic supporter to fantastic supporter to CDRI, supporter to CDRI, supporter to CDRI, CDRI, and I thank. And I thank you, Mami, for joining us today. Um, maybe I'll give a brief introduction to IRAF, and then I'll have all of you give us some of your comments here. So IRAF will enable CDRI to achieve its mandate of resilience through risk-informed investments in infrastructure development, resu resulting in reducing vulnerability of populations and reduced impact of extreme events and disasters on infrastructure systems. Our mandate, CDRI's mandate, is really technical assistance, capacity building, and knowledge generation. And the fund will allow us to pursue those three mandates. So knowledge generation, capacity building, technical assistance. One of the first initiatives that we will support will be something that we had announced last year. So our prime minister with five other prime ministers, including the prime ministers of UK, Australia, Fiji, Mauritius, um, and and Jamaica. I wasn't here last year, so I'm still getting it. And Jamaica announced the infrastructure for resilient island development states. We will be using the trust fund to launch that first um, 
call for proposals, and I'll be making another announcement on the 17th about that. So the trust fund is getting announced today. We're going to start working on operationalizing it immediately with a call for proposals for IRIS on the 17th. With that, I would really like to invite the key supporters to setting help us set this up. Um, I'll first like to invite Ms. Mami Mizutori, who has served 25 years in the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Ms. Mami is the Secretary General for Disaster, representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction at UNDRR since 2018. She's been an active supporter. I don't want to say much more, but Mami, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Amit. And it's truly a pleasure to be here at COP, seeing CDRI grow from strength to strength. Because UNDRR, we have been in the journey of making CDRI from the very beginning in 2016, when the government of India hosted the Asia Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. This idea was perceived by the Prime Minister himself, Prime Minister Modi, that we need to work on making our infrastructure resilient not only in terms of the hardware, but in many other ways. And so we started to um, uh, take this idea forward in 2019 when the Secretary General launched the Climate Action Summit. CDRI was launched formally. And here we are, 2022, at COP, launching this very important establishment of the Infrastructure Resilience Accelerator Fund. And I do really think that it's so appropriate that it's launched at COP, because COP is about many things, but one of the strongest objectives of COP is how can we support the most climate vulnerable countries, the LDCs and the SIDS, to be build their resilience, against this climate crisis. And what CDRI can offer is, as Amit just mentioned, just what they need. And it is brilliant that already this fund has been contributed by $50 million. So I also, as a member of CDRI, thank the governments of India, the UK, and Australia for your contribution, and I would like to appeal to many more governments to please contribute it to, because the resilience of infrastructure is the basis of our resilience. The Sendai framework has one of the seven global targets. We need to make sure that the loss to resilient infrastructure, the disruption of basic services does not keep on increasing and CDRI is the mechanism for that. I would like to also mention that working with CDRI, UNDRR is also generating what is called the principle for resilient infrastructure, which are six broad, very fundamental principles, because there is no global principle for resilient infrastructure at this time. These, these principles have been endorsed by more than 100 UN member states. And at this moment, uh, British Standard is taking it forward to, become, to make it an ISO. So there is a lot around resilient infrastructure, and this is exactly what we need to do. Myself to, uh, myself to uh, speak to you, to, uh, speak to you, to, uh, speak to you. And uh, let's hope that CDRI will keep on growing from strength to strength. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mazutori. Your, your support has been instrumental, and I, we will count on it to stay instrumental as we grow leaps and bounds. Um, I'd like to next invite Ken, Ambassador Ken O'Flaherty, who's the UK's government's COP26 regional ambassador to the Asia Pacific and South Asia. I met you, what, uh, two weeks ago? Yes. And it was really nice to see you come back and support us here. So, Ken, over to you.
Thank you. It's great to be here supporting um, the CDRI again. And of course, the UK um, has had the honour of supporting CDRI um, since its foundation, um, acting uh, initially as the co-chair alongside India. Now, all around the world, we are seeing increasing numbers of climate uh, and disaster events, and the Im impact of those events is growing every year. So I think it's really important to see this CDRI mandate on improving the understanding, the capacity, and international partnership to strengthen resilience of critical infrastructure. Um, I am the UK's climate ambassador um, for the Asia Pacific region, but also for small island developing states. We know that small island developing states are the most vulnerable um, states to the impacts of climate change worldwide, and that they need international support. The UK is proud to have worked closely with them during our COP26 presidency, and I think their advocacy and the fact um, of the world seeing the impacts of climate change on their states really made a difference to the results at Glasgow. In particular, we're pleased to be, have been working with CDRI and other partners in establishing IRIS, launched of course by both the Indian and UK Prime Ministers at Glasgow last year. Uh, we believe that CDRI and IRIS are very strongly aligned with the UK's own priorities around adaptation and resilience finance, and, and particularly when targeted towards the small island developing states. So it's thrilling to see the launch of the new multi-partner trust fund, or IRAF, um, to be launched today. And we think this is an important step for mobilizing and, and operationalizing both CDRI and IRIS so that activities and real impacts can be delivered on the ground. So we wish um, CDRI all the best. We are determined to continue and deepen our partnership on this vitally important agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador O'Flaherty. Um, you know, I do want to acknowledge that all of the people sitting on the stage today represent organizations that have been supporting us from not even day one, from conception. And it's come not only in form of the financial support, but it's also come in the form of technical support. It's come in, form, in the form of advisors who we can call at the middle of the night to see, you know, we have this problem and can you help address it? You know, we are two years old as an organization and we are really growing leaps and bounds. And I'll use that again and again because we are growing leaps and bounds, but it's also because of all of your support. And I want to, you know, really thank and acknowledge that. With that, I'd like to uh, invite Ambassador Kristen Tilly, who was recently appointed as Ambassador for Climate Change for the Australian government. Thanks very much, Amit. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great for Australia to be part of this conversation today. And uh, as Amit said, as others said, we've really been pleased as Australia to support CDRI. Um, we were, as mentioned, part of the initiative since the beginning or before the beginning. I uh, thank on behalf of uh, my colleagues for not too many late night phone calls. Usually when it's late night for you, it's daytime in Australia. So I think we're OK in that sense. Um, but we've been really pleased to, to be involved from the beginning and help out. Um, in particular, I'd really like to commend the approach and leadership shown by India, who's really been driving this work, um, and doing it in a way that, it, by all accounts, is very collaborative and very engaging. So we really do appreciate that. Australia is particularly supportive of the Infrastructure for Resilient Island States initiative that we've been talking about today, and committed $10 million to it uh, last year when it was first announced. And we're really pleased to see the recent progress, particularly as we just heard the launch of the multi-donor trust fund. Um, that's a really significant milestone. Um, we're pleased to be a donor in it, along with others up on the stage. And if any of you here, or certainly anyone watching a, a video of this later, is in a position to uh, equally contribute, we'd really encourage uh, being part of this great initiative. From Australia's perspective, and as a member ourselves of the Pacific family, we're really keen to see that the IRIS initiative supports projects in Pacific Island countries, which directly meet the local needs for resilient infrastructure, systems and communities. We also really appreciate the focus of this work in bringing high quality technical support to the communities themselves to ensure that they can generate and share the knowledge and innovation in the local solutions that they implement. 
Um, the benefit of that, of course, is that the wider number of communities and countries can learn and benefit from each other from these projects. And while we, we're here today as a donor and a contributor, I really want to stress that from Australia's perspective, we ourselves have a lot to learn from our colleagues and partners, particularly in developing countries, when it comes to implementing climate resilient infrastructure and solutions in their own communities. We do all face natural disasters. Australia is certainly no stranger to that. Certainly climate induced weather disasters are increasing for us as much as others. And we see a real benefit for us in being part of this in learning from the solutions that uh, the, the host countries and communities are implementing. Uh, I note it's called an accelerator fund and uh, I'd very much support the momentum that that name suggests. We're really uh, happy and pleased and ready to help you make it as much a success as possible and drive that momentum going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Tilly, for those kind words. I think you know, you've highlighted the importance of sharing solutions, and that's really what TDRI is set up to do as well, is how do we bring, and especially for IRIS, for example, you know, we are looking at small island development states across the globe. So what may be working in the Pacific could be brought to the Caribbean. What may be working in the Caribbean could be brought to Indian Ocean. Uh, and that's the kind of facility we are trying to create. So thank you again for those words. I'd like to next invite direct, uh, Ms. Carla Montesi, who's currently the director of European Union, European Commission's Director General for International Partnerships, DG Intrapa. Carla, over to you. Many, many thanks, and uh, very happy, very happy to be here with uh, all of you to launch this uh, new trust fund. Uh, you know very well that uh, European Union attach a lot of importance to our partnership with uh, CDRR. Uh, we know that uh, working in the resilience infrastructure is a key priority for the European Union. And as you just said, it's a matter where we have a lot of experience and the resources, and it's very, very important that we all share this experience and these resources in this domain. I think uh, it was already highlighted how climate will have an impact on seeds countries. We know very well the impact to reduce to reduce, to reduce vulnerabil vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities for abilities for the people, this for the people, for the people to reduce people, to reduce hum to reduce human suffering, reduce human suffering, to restore ecosystem. So, as European Union, we attach a lot of importance in working in resilient infrastructure. And I have to say that now, in the context of our international partnership, Global Gateway. We are really pushing for investment, investment in resilience infrastructure. And when we talk about infrastructure, of course, we wanted to see inf infrastructure done in the right way, with the good quality. And it's very, very important that we look and we will be able to support smart investment in quality infrastructure that will take care of the social and environment impact. This will be very, very important. So, very happy to join you in this uh, partnership. For us, this partnership is just a good example of what we talk, working in Team Europe spirit. So, talking European Union institution, but with member states, with investment bank, with the European Investment Bank, with our international partners, with our partners in the, in the third countries. So, it's very, very important. Today we are talking about seeds, but the next step that we will have with the CDRR is also working in the South Asia, because we know very well that climate and disaster resilience is a high topic also for South Asia. And just I take this opportunity to mention that this Saturday we will have one other panel in the EU pavilion where we will discuss about resilience infrastructure with the CDR. So I stop here. What I want to really wish you the best successful implementation of uh, our trust fund. Many, many thanks to you all and really good work. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Montesi, for those nice words. Um, 
finally, but most importantly maybe, but definitely very importantly, I'd like to invite Kamal Kishore, who's the member secretary for the National Disaster Management Authority for the Government of India. Kamal. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Amit. Uh, I, I have uh, a few things to say about our expectations from uh, this new trust fund. But before I do that, I think uh, even at the risk of repetition, I would like to convey my thanks uh, to uh, contributors, uh, UK, uh, the first uh, co-chair of the initiative. Uh, in just shaping the whole thing through your substantive inputs, really uh, co-creating it with us, Australia focus not just on uh, Pacific Island nations, but a broader notion of uh, resilient infrastructure and uh, EU as well, uh, right from the beginning. In fact, the first time we began to discuss uh, small islands was at the encouragement of EU. And the present co-chairs of um, CDRI, which is uh, the United States. I think it would be entirely appropriate to particularly acknowledge the leadership, encouragement, mentoring that uh, SRSG has been providing for the last uh, several years. She is the conscience keeper of the disaster risk management community. She challenges us, she ex exhorts us who work in the governments, and we look forward to your continued engagement. Long support uh, of UNDP, and I have friends and colleagues from decades sitting in the audience here. I think without your support, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, on behalf of Government of India, I can really say that it is really nice to work with such colleagues from across the world and co-create something which is of value to uh, humanity. Uh, from the government perspective, uh, Government of India perspective, we have three expectations of this fund, which, is, which it is important to highlight at this point. The first thing is that there is no glory in having a fund if it is not nimble enough. I mean, there is a reason we, we needed this mechanism. So it really needs to be very nimble, uh, flexible. I would encourage CDRI Secretariat on behalf of Government of India, as well as the co-chair of the Executive Committee of CDRI, to take risks, act swiftly, and really be very nimble and uh, you know, ha seek to achieve impact on the ground. The second thing is that it is really important that we identify opportunities to be strategic and transformative in the way infrastructure is governed uh, in the country so that we can have impact on scale. The infrastructure systems of 21st century are not going to be like they were in 20th century. Some of the infrastructure sectors in those sectors, standard setting is keeping uh, is barely managing to keep pace with the way the infrastructure is growing. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, there are countries where mobile telephone network has expanded, but there are no standards for how you build mobile phone towers. So I think it is really important that we identify those strategic opportunities and seek to achieve transformative impact. And the third is that, you know, which we've been saying again and again, ultimately it is about people. Uh, and how do we make sure that our, our work really takes a people-centric approach? We are not just looking at large physical infrastructure, you know, uh, and get overwhelmed by the figures that are thrown around, you know, 1.4 trillion per year or 94 trillion, you know, all of those numbers I personally can't comprehend. But ultimately, it has to really work for the people. So how do we bring people into the infrastructure conversation. I think that that is. So these are the three things. Be nimble, be strategic, and don't forget the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamal. I think we can always count on you to remind us that infrastructure is actually for people. Uh, so thank you with those comments. I think I really am certainly, this is a exciting, exciting, exciting moment for us. I do know everybody's calendars are tight, so let's take a good photograph so that we can remember this moment. And I do appreciate all of your support. Thank you. If, if I can ask um, the partners, the panelists to join here. So 
we've got three esteemed panelists here. We've got Dr. Ajay Mathur, who's the Director General for the International Solar Alliance. We've got Mr. Christophe Guillot from the Sustainable Development Director who, at the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. And we have Ms. Lillian Macharia, who's the Director for Portfolio Management at the Green Climate Fund. There's a reason we wanted to invite the three of you, three of you here is you've just heard us make an announcement that we are launching a trust fund as we speak. And the trust fund is intended to support technical assistance, capacity building, and knowledge generation. All three of you are partners with whom we would like to continue to work with. Some are new partnerships. Some have existed for a while. France has been a member to us from the very beginning and is actually now on the Executive Council for CDRI. So really, the intention of this panel is for the three of you to reflect from your perspectives, what is the opportunity that you see that this trust fund allows for us to work together, your organization and CDRI, or your country and CDRI? It would be get to, good to get your thoughts on that. I'll start with Mr. Gis Christophe Guillaume. From the French perspective, I would love to hear some of your thoughts about your partnership with CDRI and maybe how the trust fund is something that you see going forward. Over to you. So first of all, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like, first of all, to uh, thank you for this invitation and commend the leadership of India and the efforts undertaken by the CDRI on this topic. Your engagement contributed to put this topic at the top of the agenda, including here at COP27, where adaptation is at the heart of the discussions. France is a long-standing supporter of resilience infrastructure, especially in the building and construction sector. At COP21 was launched the Global Alliance for Construction and Building, where we continue to play a leading role. We are also very active through our cooperation agency, the Agence Française de Développement, French Air Development Agency. Therefore, I'm glad that the Green Climate Fund just approved a new partnership with Agence Française de Développement under the name PEEB Cool. It will provide 200 million euros in grants and concessional loans to address climate vulnerabilities and reduce CO2 emissions of building, renovation, and construction project in 11 countries in hot climates. Over 1.6 million people will see their living condition and resilience to heat increased. I welcome the establishment, and I'm going to your question. I welcome the establishment of the multi-partner trust fund of the CDRI as a way to support its resilient, resilient for resilient, resilient island states, which we are following with great interest as small island developing states are among the most vulnerable to climate change. The MPTF could really complement what we are doing, for instance, through the Agence Française the development, the value added of this new tool would rely in its capacity to bring synergies and complementarities between existing stakeholders and support mechanism focusing on most vulnerable contexts. France, alongside with its state and non-state partners, including of course CDRI and Indian government, is committed to continue supporting the resilience of infrastructure. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you so thank you so much for those statements and I actually also want to acknowledge and thank you because France has provided staff to us at CDRI to help design the Iris program so really want to thank you for that as well thank you um, dr. Mathur maybe over to you next you know we, we are the sister agencies we are still trying to figure out ways of how we work together the trust fund provides an interesting opportunity, so I'd like to hear from you, you know, going forward, how do you think we can work together, maybe building off on this? Thanks very, thanks very much, Amit. Uh, I hope this is working. Okay, so, 
Amit, what I'd like to do is to work, walk on two different tracks and then bring them together. The first is that as far as the International Solar Alliance is concerned, we see a huge amount of synergy in the actions of the CDRI. And the one area in particular where we have discussed earlier, we can move ahead is on creating solar facilities, particularly for the health sector in the Pacific Island countries. Island countries, but Pacific Islands in particular. This is an area where we would like to see how we can work with you. The second point, uh, Amit, that the second point that I think is important to note is that we have over a period of time seen that the amount of resources that have been put by the development finance institutions in the range of climate change projects adapt resilience as well as mitigation have actually declined over the past three years. This is largely because of COVID, but what it therefore provides us is that as COVID reduces, these development finance institutions can help move the agenda into new directions. These are the two things I want to bring together. Now, whether it is CDRI or whether it is ISA, we will help in creating pilots, demos, so that the countries can then look at scaling them up. Almost all resilience infrastructure uh, and health facilities which we are talking about are ultimately financed by national governments. It could be through the help of DFIs, etc., but ultimately it is channeled through national governments or national budgets which implies that it is important that we start looking at the blueprints of how this will happen. What, e what different kinds of the infrastructure in our case, various levels of health facilities would look like. What is the kind of equipment that will be there? What is the processes that the countries will follow to establish them? How will they procure? How will they maintain? Now, it's not as if countries don't do it, they do it today. But we are looking at them doing it in a different manner so that they are more resilient tomorrow. I think as far as the trust fund is concerned and our own resources are concerned, we would like to see how we can work with you to see how we create these blueprints which are in a sense national. So we would like to do, for example, pilots in, say, the Pacific Island states, say in one country, let's say Fiji or Tonga or the Marshall Islands, and develop the kind of detailed plans that are necessary for the country then to replicate it. This is where I think the, uh, the resources of the fund, fund would become very, become very, very useful. What it also means is a far deeper engagement at a country level. And again, I think through ultimately the process of countries saying that they are interested, there'll be some countries that are more interested than others, that is where we start. We, will, we should then look at bringing in the development financial institutions to help in the upscaling of these projects. We will do the first, we will do the heavy lifting. We will prepare the plans, we will do the pilot project. But ultimately, if we want to scale it at a national level, there have to be resources that come in from the development finance institutions. And this is where I think by involving them right now and then providing them with guidebooks on how they can move ahead, we can help bring together this agenda and see how it moves ahead. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. I think your points have, you're right on point. I mean, I think the, develop, the developing of pilots, developing of evidence, developing of, you know, new innovation in resident infrastructure is something that we can start to test out in different sectors. So health, for example, you know, for us, health is also part of the larger critical infrastructure narrative. And 
energy security. You know, when you talk about solarization of health, it's also related to energy security. We saw what happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where you know the complete power sector was damaged, and there was no power even in the critical infrastructure facilities that were available. So I think I'd love to, we will love to continue this discussion. And you mentioned development financing. You know, what we do can then be brought to the attention of financiers. And we have the one financier here who's actually working predominantly on the green climate agenda, which is the Green Climate Fund. So I'd love to hear from you, Ms. Macharya, on your reflections on how the trust fund, which is focused on technical assistance, capacity development, and knowledge can actually complement the work that you're already doing on the ground. So over to you. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, also to really echo what my previous speakers have said in terms of, first of all, appreciating the work of CDRI and also the partnership that um, we've enjoyed. Um, GCF is very happy to be associated. Um, and also, just again, before I answer your question, I would like to just step back and also appreciate what GCF is. Uh, the Green Climate Fund is a partnership organization, and therefore, we really first and foremost see CDRI, our association with CDRI in that same spirit, and, and that we work through partners, and, and the fact that also CDRI brings together a group of stakeholders with different expertise and, and, and insights and also certain uh, wealth of knowledge and resources that that is also already in itself already a bonus in terms of our potential complementarities and that's what we seek to leverage we bring financing but you also bring in a certain wealth of um, experience and expertise to the table uh, the second thing is I would like to say is with respect to the trust fund that you've, uh, the fund that you've just uh, accelerator fund that you've just uh, launched um, first the target group is one that is really core to our mandate. Um, if, as you might know, GCF has a mandate to target the vulnerable countries, of which small and island development states is one of, is, is core. So um, this then speaks to really what we are about. And, and the thing is that when we're working with small and island development states, one of the things that we really stumble against is the issue of capacity. So some of the things you've really just said that you this uh, fund is about are uh, really, really some of the things we are really grappling with when we are working with this um, and uh, the island development states. That is the technical capacity, the knowledge sharing and knowledge generation, and um, the, the, the capacity of our local entities and how we can make sure that we, um, in the way we work, make sure that we build that capacity and make sure that it is sustained over the long term, not, uh, not on a once-off basis. So the fact that that's what the fund is focusing on is already very exciting for us. And that would help us in several aspects. Um, if, we, if I step back again and look at how we look at our resilience, our approach to resilience, GCF first and foremost tries to look at um, going beyond, um, in terms of infrastructure systems um, and, and resilience, we're looking at a systems approach um, and, and building on Climate science, looking at whole, depends on having depends on having climate data, having climate data, climate data, with data, and that also assumes a certain amount of systems capacity, which would be supported by this fund. So that is something we'll be looking at in here: the climate risk assessments that would inform which um, which infrastructure to or which uh, systems to uh, climate proof and make resilient is critical. And that also talks about prioritization and helping structure uh, projects for financing and determining what kind of financing is required. We provide risk, we have a healthy risk appetite and we're able to provide, um, you know, um, I would say high risk, I mean like equity guarantees and provide, you know, comfort to other investors and crowd in that. And, and if you're able to help countries structure project in a manner that helps them crowd in other investments, then we would be able to work in with you in that respect. So we see partnership in that way. Additionally, also when we help, if, if you're able to build the capacity and work with our, we have a readiness program, which is helping countries come up with um, adaptation plans, uh, which also talks about trying to translate them into investment plans that includes both in, um, resilience action plans as well. Um, I think we see potential synergies where we could work with the fund and escort financing, so to speak, to make sure those countries 
can realize their ambitions in this way. Um, I work in the portfolio division, and I can tell you that we have projects that have been approved, but one of the challenges we see in terms of implementation is the capacity gaps. The countries have to depend on external expertise, which is not easy to procure, and that slows down implementation over a very long time. And also to retain it is also a challenge. So to the extent that this fund can help do that, that would be very, very would be excellent. So I think um, in, in, in short, we see a lot of synergies, both in terms of the ability to help countries set up systems, capacities, and also help them uh, set up knowledge bases that would help inform um, their decision and climate planning um, and their responses, being able to prioritize investments and, 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 and structure them for investment. I think that, that those are some of the areas we see. And then that would then, in a way, help us be able to come in and provide the financing, including taking the early risk that would help, um, then crowding other investments. I'm happy to provide other details. Thank you. That, thank you so much for, I think, you you know, systems, capacities, knowledge. I think that that is, uh, we are also finding as even for our organization, you know, the capacity side has been something that we've, we're also working to understand. You know, when you talk about disaster risk or disaster resilient infrastructure, it's quite a new field. It's not, not something that has been talked about a lot, uh, you know, adaptation itself. When you look at financing, it, a lot of it goes towards mitigation because people are still trying to understand how do you build portfolios of adaptation project. So you're the director for sustainable development. You heard the gap that has been talked about on capacities. I know that AFD is doing a lot of work in that space. So maybe I'd like to get some reflections from you of the models of capacity development that you've seen that seems to be successful. You know, we, we do a lot of, F, we, a lot of us put a lot of effort in capacity development. Some are successful, other may not be. So I thought maybe from your reflecting back on AFD's work maybe, or the French government's work, how are you looking at capacity development and what do you see as success when you talk about capacity development? Thank you for your question. I mean, you're referring to capacity building expertise worldwide or on this specific item? Okay, okay, okay. Um, I have some experience prior to uh, being the director of sustainable development. I was posted several years in, in, in Africa I was previously ambas French ambassador to Cameroon for three years and, and in Djibouti, where I mean, we have a lot of actions, uh, project development actions through the AFD. So I have some, some background on this. Uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's very important and it's, uh, I would say it's a bottleneck, the expertise that developing countries have to have on, on, on on capacity building uh, on project. And as you mentioned, I mean, we tend, I mean, IFD is a huge, it's a huge organization. And probably we don't have, and it's not only actual, I mean, it, I mean we're trying to improve the, the situation, but probably we tend to impose our views on developing project because in front of us, we don't have, mainly speaking, we don't have the expertise, sufficient expertise that we could challenge the views that we have fr from France or, or from Paris. And, and that's a huge question. Um, and it's, I mean, it's even more critical on PPPs. And PPPs, I mean, we're not talking about PPPs, but I think Cameroon, for example, we have new ideas. We were trying to uh, to launch PPPs project, which are very complicated. And in front of us, the Cameroonians, but many other countries don't have the knowledge, don't don't understand how how uh, sensitive are those issues. And and we try more and more when we launch project, when we finance development project, to have the capacity building funding to support the countries into this. But it's a crucial question. 
I know it's not an easy answer. So thank you for that response. I think, you know, because one of our mandates is capacity building. And uh, you can see why, because I think in this, I don't know how many people in this room, many people in this room might know the, this room might know the word, room might know the word, know the word, the, 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 you know, understand what that actually means. And this room is filled with people who, who are at the climate summit. So when you go on the ground and you start to talk about resilience, I think people look at you and say, yeah, what does that mean, you know? So I think part of why I'm also asking this question is because capacity building is a big mandate for us. We need to be able to package information, bring information, help people understand the importance of resilience. And that's not easy to do. And I think all of our organizations are trying to push that agenda, which is why I wanted to ask that question. I'm going to ask the same question to you, Dr. Mathur, because you've been now practicing in the field for a long time and have seen capacity building succeed and maybe not succeed. And so I'd love to hear about, you know, what makes a good capacity building effort work? I mean, what is, what is this, this recipe, the secret recipe behind capacity building? Amit, I wish I had figured out the secret recipe. Uh, all I can say is walk along the path that you mentioned. Some things have worked and some things happened. So let me start with what has not worked. When we go in, and start talking to the people who are responsible for putting an alternate agenda in place, a resilience agenda, the first thing you need to do is to focus on design. The problem is design is done once, twice, thrice, not too many times, but it's implemented many, many, many more times. So the need for implementation is much higher, but unless you focus on the preparation you never come to that. Now, as far as we are concerned, I'm, and I'm going to be completely candid about this, we get caught in the preparation trap. It's not as if preparation isn't important. I would argue that as far as preparation is concerned, <clears throat> using national resources together with international resources is the way to go about it rather than having training programs on preparation. Because on the job training stays. And you don't need too many people. But the second one is much more important. How do you make it happen? <clears throat> Again, I strongly, I'm of, the, I'm of the school of thought which believes that doing things is the best training. <clears throat> so therefore doing Pilot projects is important. You involve people in it, but in the process, train them as trainers. That's the time when you go in for larger scale capacity building. Now, the challenge here becomes, you train a lot of people, what do they do? If you train them and there are no projects happening, they figure out why on earth did I get trained, and they forget it very soon. On the other hand, if you have got projects and you haven't got trained people, then the implementers of those projects start wondering, where do I find people from? Short point, and again, this is something that I've learned the hard way. These two things have to be in sync. The timetables will differ from country to country. <clears throat> in fact, they may even differ. But at the heart of it, creating some kind of a certification for implementation is important. That gives the implementers, the developers, the confidence that here are people who I employ who will do the job properly. And certification places the guys who are trained in a different category from everybody else in the job market. So we are helping in job creating opportunities in various countries. The last point, Amit, that I would like to make is one of the most difficult places to create capacity is policy making. Policy making is an area where there is a lot of received wisdom. There are, in many cases, captures by existing vested interests, I mean, in my own area, 
the diesel lobby is often at odds with the solar lobby. And I'm very sure that, you know, the cement and concrete lobby is, again, a huge lobby which focuses on creating hard infrastructure. This, again, is something that you look at, and I'll, the best practice is you do a project, <clears throat> involve the policymakers, and see how the change happens. Nothing interests politicians more than how to create jobs and get more votes in the next election. And therefore, showing that a project works and then them changing policies so that more such projects work is, I have found, the only way to get policymakers involved. You will find one policymaker, two policymakers, three policymakers who are interested in it because it makes sense. But the large numbers of people are essentially there to do what is told to them. Let me end here, and I think a, a discussion is needed on the kinds of capacity building that shows up as promising in different areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, and thank you for highlighting the political support for all of this, because end of the day, I think this is where the vocabulary becomes important. You know, because when I say resilience, it doesn't ring a bell. When I say flooding, I think it rings a bell. When I say heat, extreme heat, rings a bell, right? So I think how do we then communicate in a way which the policymakers, the politicians start to understand the value of what we're trying to promote? And I think that's also part of our role. I'll leave you with the final words because you started the capacity building uh, the, the circle, but, but we have to really see how we can, you know, push the agenda of capacity building. I think it's really the what we would like to promote as CDRI is to build capacity around the world. So over to you. Okay. Um, after the previous speakers, buyer beware. This is going to be disappointing. So it's not going to be as hot, as insightful as the previous speakers. But I'll, I'll just say a few things. Um, one is... As you say, first, it has to be really simple. I mean, simplify it and make it really context-specific. Um, you can't cut and paste from different contexts and come and apply it wholesale in every other context. So you have to really think about what does this mean for this context. So you take it from where the people, what, what it is, what it is, whatever it, what it is, whatever it is you want to bring to them, what does that mean and translate it in a language and in a manner that m they can relate to. So that's the first thing. Not because I'm a capacity building expert, but just because I think this is what seems to resonate with where I've seen it work. Um, the second part of it is, I think, in terms of um, what, how you build it, as you say, you have to have a mix where, especially where needed, sometimes you have to have a mix between international and local because sometimes the expertise is just not available local, and, and that sometimes is a politically sensitive um, topic, but I guess that's where the context specificity and understanding how you communicate that becomes important. But you have to figure out how you communicate that to make sure that that's understood and why you're doing that mix. Um, and then the com capacity building has to be deliberate. Um, sometimes I find that it is too short so that you have trained people that it's within a project, but that's not enough to stick. So you may have to do it a much longer time, and that, that, that's a bit more deliberate. It's not comfortable for most people, but it's something that you may have to advocate for. Um, and then the final one I would say is then you may have to think about making sure that you also have a critical mass. Because if you have one or two people, um, and then you train them, they become very competitive, they are poached, and then you have no, the capacity is gone. So you may have to train enough people um, so that when that capacity, even if one person moves, you still have enough. And that you also have in place a continuity mechanism so that, as you say, there's continuous training that goes on after the, the, the initial training um, cohort is, 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 is trained. Um, just a few thoughts, um, not, nothing as moving. Thank you very much.
thank you. I think these are, you know, these are important for us because as we start to build out the infrastructure resilience for small island development states, the issue of capacity keeps coming back. You know, the capacity may or may not be there on the ground. So I think for us, as we start to build out this support system, how do we ensure that that capacity stays on, stays on the ground is going to be something we'll keep coming back to. So I do value all of your thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. It is an important moment for us. We do want to, you know, work with all of you as partners and build on the, con the, the important moment here as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you.